With scenes of desperate migration never far from our screens, the question surely must be how to create jobs, opportunity, and hope for the next generation. 30% of North Africa and the Arab world is 14 years old or younger. That's 41% in Africa. Bill Clinton has devoted his post-presidency to solving this very question, as he told me at his foundation's conference in Morocco. I think the most important thing we can do is to give the young people in the Middle East and elsewhere an alternative vision of the future that is more inclusive and more positive. So how does that happen when it comes to the programs his foundation sponsors? I asked his daughter, Chelsea Clinton, who's now vice chair of the NGO, as well as Kennedy Odede, whose girls' school in a Nairobi slum is sponsored by the foundation, and Asma Mansour, a Tunisian activist who's trying to spur social entrepreneurship in her country. Welcome, welcome to you all. Let me start with you, Chelsea, because you are vice chair now of the Clinton Foundation. What about your current trip has really staggered you or stood out for you? Uh, I saw Kennedy a few days ago in Nairobi um, at Farasi Lane School, um, which is one of our partners in the Clinton Global Initiative commitment to really try to close the secondary education gap that still exists not only across the continent of Africa, but really around the world. Um, so there are now almost as many girls as there are boys in primary school everywhere, but almost nowhere are there as many girls as there are boys in secondary school. And so Kennedy and I were at Farasi Lane, and I was really staggered by how much progress is already being made, and we just have to keep making that progress. And I have to ask you, because you are a new mother, this obviously takes on a much bigger urgency, does it? Completely. I mean, I didn't know that I could care any more about the enfranchisement, the equality, and the empowerment of women and girls until I became a mother and until I had a daughter. And somehow, I do care just even more intensely and emphatically about all the work that we're doing. And I've been to Kibera, so I really know that, that slum. What is it that f forced you, really, to look at your own situation and say, no, I'm not going to allow this to happen for the next generation of boys, but mostly girls, because you've made a school for girls there? There was no hope. Nairobi is a city whereby there's a lot of wealth. At the same time, there's a lot of poverty. I grew up on the street when I was the age of 10. Because you, know, you can see how much was that. You can see how much my mom was trying and other women in the community. It was so, so hard. Asma, you came of age politically, socially during the Arab Spring. Tunisia has been the example to all of us. How did you, growing up in a conservative and traditional family, burst onto the scene? A lot of people say that uh, we did the a revolution in Tunisia, but I think I personally, I made my own revolution. I, I come from a conservative family and uh, I was raised with, uh, it's, it's clear for me that I had to get married at a certain age before the 30, as uh, everyone else, you know, it's like, uh, this is how we grow up with these kind of ideas. So I think that uh, the challenge for us is, and the main point is that we don't really dream and uh, uh, our society don't allow us to dream. So in the end, what did you end up doing? I discovered uh, social work in us and, and, and in your life. Kennedy, you alluded to the violence that your family had gone through. Two of your sisters were raped and they were made pregnant. They had no hope and no future. What are you trying to do now with this school? How are you protecting the girls? First of all, I grew up a very, very angry man. Very, very angry with the society, no job, no matter how much you try to look for a job, it's so difficult. So wha what I wanted to do in my community was to have this school be a symbol, okay, of how to, to changing the way of people thinking, you know? So we have this school that is now providing free school for girls, but it's not only for women. At the same time, men were not happy with me for that. So I have to come with the idea. The idea was that to link the school to social services, like healthcare that men also love, library, all those kind of things. That's when men became part of the school. And now in the community, there's a lot of hope. Rape cases have gone down. And you can see what happened when people see the light. How important is it, Chelsea and Asma, to actually bring the men into the equation that then empowers the women and girls? Well, I think it's hugely important. 
you know, it is partly a resource challenge. There aren't enough schools, there aren't enough teachers, there aren't enough materials. Um, but there are many other barriers or ceilings. There are more than 700 million women around the world who were married before the age of 18. Because we know that for every additional year of secondary school that a girl has, she earns 10% per year more in income. But that's money that she can not only invest in her family, but in her community. That's also good for her country because then she's paying taxes on that increased income. So we have to be able to make this argument calmly but persuasively. So how important is it for you and do you see a change in getting men on board to understand that the future of Tunisia, for instance, is equally in the hands of women as it is in the hands of men? We should not just focus on men, but I think we should focus on families and parents and uh, how to uh, get into them, it's through the media. It's because uh, if we think in Tunisia, uh, the, ent the main entertainment for a lot of people in, in the countryside and the rural area is the, the TV and the radios and so on. So you've, you've mentioned a couple of things, role models, media, and also employment. I know for you, equal pay for equal play is very important. Maybe people are surprised to know that in the United States, the greatest democracy, women are still earning something like 78 cents to every man's one dollar. Yeah, absolutely, and I just want to echo what Asma said. I think it's hugely important um, that we help people close the imagination gap. I mean, even in the United States, um, female characters in G-rated movies, so those most consumed by children, are often only you know 10 percent of male characters in terms of kind of how often they speak, how prominent they are. So this is a challenge, again, even in our own country. You know, but to answer your question about equal pay for equal work, I mean, there's no country in the world where women are paid equally to men. Um, Belgium is the closest. So in Belgium, it's 94 cents to every dollar. Um, and although that is tremendous, that's still not parity. So we know we need to be doing more um, to ensure that women are paid equally for equal work and also enabled to participate in work equally. So let me follow that up because, you know, there's also, as we all know, been a terrible spate of violence in Kenya. There was the attack on hundreds of school children, university, college students at Garissa, and before that, the Westgate Mall in Nairobi. And you wrote a lot about it, particularly you said that the only way to stop this kind of terrorism is to bring an end to urban poverty. If that doesn't end, what do you think is going to happen? More kids are going to get radicalized? Yeah, that's because they're taking advantage of these hopeless young people, you know, who are being given hope, you know, who are being kind of being lied to, you know. And we talk about Kenya, this uh, the now in the, the Al Shabaab, for example, in, in, in Somalia, they are coming to Kenya, they are going to the slums in Mombasa, slums in Nairobi, because they know these people are hopeless. The only way to fight this is by investing in the communities, giving these young people hope. What you are doing there, creating entrepreneurship spirit. I think it's really generalized for a uh, lot of Tunisian youth uh, because uh, even at university or at school, we, we have this system of uh, we should almost copy paste what uh, the teacher or the professor told us, otherwise we're punished. That's right. I've heard that the education in most of the Arab world is, as you say, copy paste, learn by rote, no critical thinking. Yeah. That's a revolution in education that has to happen yeah. in this and part of the world. And it's not just at school, it's also at families. So we are about out of time. I want to ask you a lightning round. That means a very quick sort of few word answers. Chelsea, what was the most inspiring, motivating thing in your life? What person, what event that's led you to where you are today? My grandmother, my mother's mother, um, who had a life that I couldn't even imagine because of the choices that she made in her life. She was born to teenage parents who weren't married. Um, they abandoned her twice um, by the age of eight. She got shipped out to live with her grandparents. She had to start to support herself when she was 13, but she still managed to finish high school while she was still working. Um, and she had no model of a loving family in her own life, but she created a loving family for my mother and imbued in her a sense that she could be anything she wanted to be in her life. And so she had this mantra that life is not about what happens to you, it's about what you do with what happens to you. And I think about that every day. And one of my great regrets is that my daughter won't know my grandmother um, except for the stories that I'll tell her. And Kennedy? I found love in books. And I used to read books of Martin Luther King Jr. and the books of Nelson Mandela, President Clinton. 
It kind of gave me a dream. It kind of gave me hope in life. Because I remember growing up, I used to smash people's car because I was angry man. You know, this was happening. But when I saw those people, I was like, I want to be like them. So for me, that really changed my life a lot. Asma Mansour, Kennedy Odede, Chelsea Clinton. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank and thank you all. Thank you. That was in Morocco in front of an audience there in the capital, Marrakesh. Now, Cuba's president, Raul Castro, visited Pope Francis this weekend, thanking him for helping broker a new phase in U.S.-Cuban relations. The communist leader gave the Catholic pope a painting of a crucifix made from wooden barges. He said it was inspired by the Pope's trip to Lampedusa and the washed-up migrant barges. It may be a case of art imitating life, as we imagine a world next where the wrecks of that port are transformed by the migrants who once landed there. That's when we come back.